So I would like to get us started off by hearing from industry about the geopolitics that I was asked about in the beginning, how geopolitical has the world become and how do you feel it? And I would like to start with Johannes Pockrand and Citigroup's perspective. Do the geopolitical changes that the newspapers now talk about really affect your clients and all the markets that you serve and in which ways? Thank you very much. Um, they definitely do. I mean, thinking about global politics, thinking about geopolitical trends is something we've been doing for a long time. Um, as a bank, we try to do you know, global business with and for our clients. We want to be, we aspire to be the preeminent banking partner for institutional clients with cross-border needs. And when you enter a, uh, a time that you could almost characterize as one of systemic fragmentation, then that is first and foremost a challenge for you know, us as a bank, because we, of course, have to meet very different regulatory requirements in very different jurisdictions. But it is even more of a challenge for, for our clients. And while we do think we have an advantage uh, that derives from our globality and our experience in, in, in markets, um, you know, many, many clients who think about entering new markets um, you know, face challenges. Um, I think an obvious one at the moment is a, is a much greater focus on operational resilience. Uh, we've just seen that cutting a single cable can, can put several countries, uh, you know, disconnect several countries at once and for a, a sustained period of time. Um, when we think about trade routes, um, and we do a lot of wiring and plumbing uh, for our clients and a lot of, sort of payments uh, across, across borders, but also a lot of trade finance, um, then uh, you know, how secure these trade routes are, how resilient they are, is a, is a whole different uh, discussion uh, now than it was, than it was a, few, a few years ago. I think what's also uh, very clear, and um, Anna can, can talk about this in a much more educated fashion, but we're arguably in a time where at a global level, but certainly in the United States and in Europe, um, supply side shocks play a significant role and where monetary policy um, as a response um, is um, you know, potentially less impactful um, as it was um, on the demand side. So as, as we face supply side shocks, and I think the country uh, in Europe that I know best and that we sit in is a good example, um, as you think about economies and clients in economies that are facing supply side shocks, there's an all new discussion about fiscal space about the role of public investment. Um, and to turn my remarks into a, a, a bit more positive, that's of course an opportunity depending uh, in which business you're in. Right? So uh, in Europe, certainly we're thinking uh, about energy, we're thinking about, we're thinking about the defense sector in a, in a whole different way. Uh, and at Citi, we're pleased to see that the importance of financial markets um, you know, for energy infrastructure, for, defen for the defense sector, um, and also other sectors is, is becoming much more topical. And the discussion is helpful because it has a new kind of granularity. The European Commission last month published a paper where they looked at the reasons for the lack of equity financing, but not sort of globally or you know, across Europe or in European markets, but in the European defense sector. It's a fascinating read, and I think that is, that is work that is really worth doing to look at individual sectors um, and, and look at the reasons why capital market financing, why equity financing um, is, is so scarce and what the barriers are, right? And overall, I think we see in Europe, and I think it's fair to say as a response to the geopolitical situation in which we are, we see great, uh, almost unique momentum around building out capital markets. Uh, we had a very ambitious paper um, published by uh, the Eurogroup, not just Euro area finance ministers, but the Eurogroup in inclusive format, so all finance ministers of all EU member states, um, you know, defining what we need to do around architecture, around businesses, around citizens, ABC, to, to, to build capital markets out. Um, very concrete calls uh, also to incentives, um, and you know, in an election year here in the UK, and of course, if, as we approach November 5th in the United States, um, there's still a lot that can be done at individual member state level in the EU. So I think 
you know, in summary, um, there are difficult uh, challenges um, for, for different clients in different sectors, but there's also very, very helpful momentum um, as justifiably different governments around the world, different sovereign states think about economic security, um, but also about uh, economic competitiveness. And the latter is the one to focus on if you want to uh, you know, approach this in a, in a positive spirit. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So economic uh, security and competitiveness and the fact that both of them are linked uh, to a certain degree politically um, is, a, is an important point and I also take with you that the political response of the past, which was the silent monetary policy, is increasingly becoming replaced by more need for some fiscal space, and I think that's something we can respond to. Let me move uh, from you to Niels Tom and ask about uh, Deutsche Börse's perspective and, and possibly have you focus on the relationship with China. It is a quite unusual joint venture to have a uh, joint venture directly um, with the Chinese uh, partners, and uh, we always tend to think that China is the biggest elephant in the room that one should talk about when we talk about geopolitics. I'd like to hear if you agree and uh, what to you the challenges are. Yes, certainly. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, uh, I, I think the joint venture I'm heading is, is even more unique because it's not based in China, but it's based in Frankfurt. Um, we are connected to the systems, trading systems of Deutsche Börse. So we, we are a German company and, and we have a German trading system, etc. Um, so that makes us unique also for the Chinese side um, uh, because they, they don't have, in a way, the direct influence on us uh, regarding supervision, etc. Having that said, I think one, one general remark to, to where we are in, in, in capital markets and a little bit uh, also alluding to what, what Johannes already said is I think capital markets in general have proven that they become more and more independent of political dynamics. Um, I mean, if you, if you look at uh, the effect that the Brexit vote um, uh, back in the days had on, on markets, um, that was tremendous. Uh, the market drop was uh, over 20% in one day. Um, I think regulation-wise and, and system-wise, um, Europe proved to be very stable and resilient, um, also because of regulation after the financial crisis. Um, but uh, so since then, um, you always see fluct uh, in a, way, a lot of volatility uh, around those events, but they're not as big as they used to be. Um, when it comes to China, I think it's 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 a, it also it's a, a, in a way more untypical capital market uh, because it started out to be very much retail driven. So a lot of retail investors were active in the market. Um, uh, the ratio in, in, in Western capital markets um, is more 90% institutional investors. The rest is uh, retail investors. In China, it used to be the other way around. Um, since 2015, 16, they have been after their, their, they had a capital market crisis. They have invested a lot in reg financial regulation. They have invested a lot in the prof professionalism of the capital market. So the ratio of institutional investors is growing. It's around 60% plus now. Um, but of course, the big difference is they're somewhat detached to the global financial markets because they've not fully opened up uh, to the global financial markets. You still have entry barriers into the capital market, but you also have, in a way, some barriers uh, of free flow of capital out, out of China, for example. Uh, so our role is more or less trying to bridge uh, between, uh, in a way, the European capital market and also the Chinese capital market by a variety of products. <clears throat> but uh, I always see there is an inherent dilemma for the Chinese, because on the one hand, they realize that they need a strong capital market um, for the dual circulation and for the fulfillment of the dual circulation. Um, so, in a way, uh, on the one hand, a sovereign, more or less autonomous um, uh, economy within China uh, w together with a strong capital market. They're trying to build that now. Um, but, of course, I alluded to this earlier, is um, where they can control the, the flow of products, uh, of product uh, and, 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 and uh, 
goods and uh, etc. of trade much more because it's much more physical. Uh, it's of course much harder to control um, uh, the flow of capital once you open up. Um, so this is the inherent dilemma I'm, 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 I'm seeing and, and the pace um, of opening up the capital market is of course therefore much, much slower than in other areas and other industries that we have that we have witnessed over the last decades. Um, right now, it's uh, it's kind of interesting because <clears throat> I think uh, there is um, again a step m towards more opening up um, uh, as the economic recovery after the Corona crisis and and also the economic growth in general is slowing down. Um, they realize that for the implementation of the dual circulation and the strategic, uh, um, in a way, independence they are seeking for, as well as, of course, uh, not to forget the renminbi as one of the le world leading currencies they want to establish, they are starting to think about ways how to open up even more than before. So I think that's the current state I'm, I'm observing. Um, this is still, in a way, I would say, a longer route to go, and, and whether they will fully connect to the global capital markets uh, I think that will be the, the very interesting question to, to look at. Um, currently, I don't see that they will fully um, integrate into the global capital market yet. Interesting. So I can even connect uh, the two of your responses. The Europeans are building a capital market. The Chinese are trying to build a, f a capital market. And in a way, we can see who will make more progress uh, quickly in maybe some years from now. But I'll let you <laughs> respond to one another in a, in a second round. Thank you for this response. Let me move into a second set of questions on uh, more the political side, the multilateral and the bilateral side um, in uh, responses one can have. Rüdiger von Kleist, you are our government representative here on the panel and uh, have a long experience in the multilateral financial institutions. And I would like to hear from you uh, maybe a response to the discussion about China from the regulator side. Is China uh, in the multilateral infrastructure, we know, I'll just shorthand this, the Bretton Woods institutions represented in a way that corresponds to our international financial system today. What is really still to be done to not have a parallel uh, multilateral Chinese-led uh, um, financial architecture rise that will make it very difficult, not just uh, to ensure financial stability, but even sovereign stability, if you could speak to that. Uh, well, thank you very much. i start with two simple truths, and you already uh, alluded to that. I think China is underrepresented in the post-World War II Bretton Woods institutions. At the moment, we have a stalemate between the US not wanting to grant any ground to, to China and Japan, obviously, who's still second biggest uh, shareholder in both the World Bank and, 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 and the IMF, and also doesn't want China to surpass it for political grounds. But I think economically, it's pretty clear. They should be bigger. That's the first. And the second thing is whenever we talk about anything uh, uh, on the global scale where we could reach a multilateral solution, and you also alluded to that China is either the main topic or the elephant in the room. <laughs> I'll just give three examples. Uh, one is, of course, the, uh, the uh, Russian attack on Ukraine. That conflict would take a very different course if China and, to some lesser extent, India would not buy off Putin all the oil and other resources he wants to sell. So we, we are trying, you know, from, from the Western countries, we are trying to, uh, you know, uh, uh, impose sanctions and, and try to cut off the financing side of the war on the Russian side. But China and, 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 and to, as I said, let's say, agree, India are simply channeling any amount of money uh, uh, Russia needs to them. The second, uh, second example is uh, climate change, of course, both on the, on the volume of, of, of uh, uh, climate uh, uh, adaption that needs to be achieved in China, but also on the financing side. We are not going to achieve any viable solution on the financing of, 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 of climate change for poorer countries if China doesn't participate. And the third example is, is the looming debt crisis in, in, in poor countries. China is by far the biggest bilateral creditor to poor countries. So there is no solution for, uh, for the poor countries in sight if China doesn't participate. So that's simply the fact. So how do we and how do the Chinese deal with it? 
The Chinese have been very, how should I call it, uh, they have been very successful at sort of playing ball in the international institutions, uh, you know, acting very multilaterally, trying to support everything, except if it comes to their own ingrained interests. And there, I think over the course of the last maybe five, six years, I mean, China used to basically just sit there and grow. I think that was the first phase. You know, they just made sure they were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, accumulating reserves, making sure, you know, they get dominant market positions in so many countries. For five or six years, they have been starting to increase the use of this uh, economic uh, strength to, you know, get, uh, uh, get political leverage. And they are doing that in the international institutions as well. I'll uh, uh, take two examples again. Uh, we have the G20 common framework on debt resolution. We are, again, without China, we're not going to move anywhere. We have had a stalling process with four, five or six countries where simply China is not willing to accept the last step to actually achieve a debt resolution for those countries. We're talking about Chad or Zambia or, or any other number of cases because China is not used to, you know, this role of, okay, you made a bad investment decision, you need to pay for it. You know, we've been used to doing that for, for decades, but, you know, the Chinese are still learning to do that, but it's very slow and it's a bad, bad thing for the poor countries because they actually would need a swift debt, debt resolution. Second example, the founding of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, basically as a, as a, as a, a move because they couldn't gain more foothold in the Bretton Woods institutions, they founded their own investment bank which Germany joined for good reasons. The US didn't join, some other countries did not join because they felt they didn't want to support this sort of Chinese bank. We feel it's completely different. We feel it's important to work together with China to make sure that this bank, like any other bank, uh, like any other multilateral bank, uh, uh, upholds high social and, and, and economic and environmental standards so that we make the world a better place, also through the AIIB and its, uh, its involvement with, with, with countries in need who need, who need the financing. So those are just two examples. Um, maybe I'll stop here and, and, you know, any other example anybody wants to quote, we can talk about that. But there are myriads of, of yeah. points of contact with China. It's simply the elephant in the room yes. in global cooperation at the moment. Excellent. Those are a lot of topics, but also some pretty deep fault lines. So let me stay with some of the fault lines and get our attention closer to the transatlantic uh, cooperation and partnership. And uh, Mark Pelovich, you are here as the American in my panel, <laughs> um, but also an expert on Europe. So I would like to hear from what you've studied of international financial markets and the stability that we're also trying to achieve, what are the current challenges and what type of cooperation do you think is needed to get us into a sounder or more serene financial system? <laughs> so the easy question, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest challenge right now, you have the economic challenges in terms of coming out of COVID and then you have the political challenges, right? So a lot of the... Uh, like you, I study international political economy and I see geopolitics everywhere, but really I think everybody is talking about a new era of geopolitics right now. And what most people seem to mean when you start asking them what they mean by geopolitics is there are very serious problems within domestic politics going on in the United States and in China and in, uh, uh, in Germany and in other EU countries. So, you know, I think the... The economic challenges transatlantically are that the U.S. economic recovery has been much stronger than the European recovery and the German economic recovery, and transatlantic relations tend to ebb and flow um, and are driven often by disjunctures between the economic performance on both sides of the Atlantic. So, uh, so that's a problem uh, more here in Europe, I think, than in the United States and how Germany and Europe think about investment policies and economic policies that can help uh, um, kickstart the economic recovery, which is starting to head towards what looks like another lost decade. We had the Eurozone crisis lost decade and now the fallout from, uh, from the war and the pandemic. Um, so I think economically that's the big challenge. I think politically the big challenge, um, as I think everybody knows, is rising 
you can call it populism, you can call it far-right authoritarianism, everybody has a different term for it, but both in the US and here in Germany, in Hungary, in the EU more broadly, we're dealing with this problem that the two largest financial powers in the international system, who have been the bedrock of the international financial institutions that have been the heart of the global economy for 80 years now, are facing rising forces at home of parties that don't value that. They don't value the institutions, they don't value the transatlantic relationship, they don't value the cooperation. Um, and that is, of course, an even bigger problem when those things are happening in the United States. And given the structure of our political system, right, you have wild swings in policy between Democratic and Republican administrations now, which creates an enormous amount of uncertainty. Right? So the, the reason we created international organizations like the IMF and the World Bank and the WTO is primarily to reduce uncertainty, um, to have some sort of basis of rules where even if there is temporary or periodic defection, most of the time there's cooperation transatlantically and in the global economy. And that is very hard to sustain when the United States and the EU both are facing problems within their own politics of whether or not those institutions are valued. Right? And so um, the US and the EU accuse each other of different forms of protectionism and not violating and sticking to the rules. Um, but at the end of the day, for a very long period of time, there were solid majorities in both parties in the United States that valued transatlantic cooperation. And there were solid majorities of the key governments and the largest countries in the EU that at the end of the day valued transatlantic cooperation, right? And so the, the biggest uncertainty is uncertainty at home, right? And I think we talk a lot about that as geopolitics, um, but it's much more, I see it, that the problems are about domestic politics, right? And the, the geopolitics will work itself out if we can address the domestic political problems. And I think you see the same thing in China. Right, so the, the discussion uh, that has come up already about China playing a greater role in the international financial institutions, in opening up, um, removing capital controls, opening up to global capital flows, um, all of those things could happen and on balance I think those would be positive things for global financial stability in the international economy. Uh, but they would require Xi Jinping and the Chinese government to basically implement a set of policies which are at the complete and total odds with their domestic political incentives right now. Um, so, you know, much of, that's sort of how I view it as, a, as someone who studies international political economy, that most of what we're wrestling with and struggling with about a new geopolitical order and problems of international relations are really problems of the domestic political challenges at home. Which doesn't make me more optimistic, but nope. <laughs> I'll, take, uh, I'll take it as a, a take-home point. And I'd like to uh, maybe move our um, discussion from just the distribution of challenges and, um, uh, and the perspectives in, in, in industry and in government to the question of problem solving. Financial markets are global markets. We know the financial system is a system that provides <laughs> incentives, huge incentives for economic and political action, and I would like to see if that is a way of addressing the challenges we have uh, in front of us, in particular, saving the planet and uh, making the world a better place. Somebody said, I like it, I'll, I'll take that. And uh, so the last uh, two questions um, are going to revolve ar around this um, problem-solving capacity, and I'll start with Katarina Gnad. What do you see as the challenge uh, of international climate finance for uh, international financial institutions in the financial order more generally? Thank you, uh, Cornelia. Uh, problem solving and making the planet a better place in two minutes. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll try. Um, we have already heard from uh, Rudika von Kleist that um, climate finance is one of the big issues uh, in, on the financial and political agenda right now. Um, and looking into the international f uh, negotiations within the UN, but also within the G20, uh, we are really seeing, and this is sort of a very clear message that has come out of Dubai of the last COP, we are seeing a huge climate finance gap right now. Um, and 
the, the sort of the challenge or the, or the, or the, the, the task is to, to mobilize this, uh, this money and, and the funds particularly for the vulnerable countries and particularly for the developing world who do not have the public means to address both questions of mitigation but also much more increasingly questions of adaptation and, and uh, the big question of loss and damage. So what do we do? Um, I think there are sort of two parts of this, this answer and Europe, the EU and the US actually should play a very big role in this and they do. Um, and this is one on the public side. We are currently trying to negotiate internationally a new collective quantified goal on finance um, in, the, in the COP framework, if you want. And there we really need to see now from the donor countries, uh, and there the sort of North Atlantic Alliance uh, can play a role if they, wish to, uh, if they wish so, to really see commitments going forward, early commitments now towards this goal. This is going to be difficult because as we uh, have just heard from Mark, um, we face political uncertainty on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, we have election years coming up. Um, but there I really see, see a role and I also see a, a, a coordination role between uh, the EU and the US uh, going forward. And the second sort of leg, if you want, is, is really the private side. And then we're sort of coming full circle uh, and private sector involvement in financing this green transition, the energy transition, uh, but more specifically also uh, climate change uh, policies. Um, and there the question really is, how can we bring the private sector better in? Is it sort of, do we need further international regulation? Do we need sort of a political uh, collaborative will to uh, catalyze finance um, so that the private sector can follow suit? Um, do we need more sort of voluntary commitments? The answer is probably we need all of this. Um, but I think this is sort of one of the big challenges that we are facing uh, over, over the next 12 to 18 months, uh, at least until the Brazilian COP in 2025. Uh, and if we go back to the sort of problem solving side, um, there I would really urge the European uh, policymakers and the US even if there's an election coming up, and I, I, I know how, how difficult it is to play these topics, to really sort of make sure that, um, that these topics are not going to be um, ignored, because at the end of the day, we know many institutions have been charged with sort of looking into this climate change and, and, and um, the green transition have a stabilizing role to play, or they are destabilizing if we don't do anything about it, and then, uh, and then we will sort of be in the territory of financial instability in the medium term, which is something that we are trying to avoid. Thank you very much, and that is almost a transition to the second and uh, question on this topic, and the last I would like to ask to Anna Holzhausen. Bringing the private sector in, you monitor and you assess what happens on capital markets, and uh, there's a lot of attempts to bring the private sector in through reporting standards, through other um, type of transformations, and I would like to just hear your general assessment. Is it working, and what kind of impact can these ESG standards have? Yeah, thank you, thank you. And first of all, I mean, we also try to avoid right now the wording ESG standards because we okay. also learn that it's a little bit wrong. It's this contested, political contested. What's, what will replace it? <laughs> we replace it with sustainability, the broader okay. concept. Because I think ESG is a little bit misleading because with these three uh, letters, it implies that this is very detailed, this is very concrete, but it isn't. Mm -hmm. Especially the S is very vague. So it's better to have this kind of talking about sustainability. And then when we talk about sustainability, for sure, as an insurance company, we feel it on our both sides of our balance sheet. We see it on the liability side, we see it on the asset side, liability side, underwriting. You probably heard all about the stories that already American insurers stopped doing new business, to doing underwriting new homes in California because of netcats, because of the frequency and severity of uh, netcat events. So this is already, we are already very close to a situation where we see this kind of uninsurability. Mm. And that means that we clearly use our means, what we have is this our asset side, our investment, to change things, to be on the, uh, on the one of the agents to transform, to bring the transformation ahead. And when we talk about sustainability, as Johannes also mentioned, it's not only about the climate, climate crisis, for sure, emission reduction, but it's also about geopolitics. Mm. And 
I mean, we can see it. I mean, our role also as insurer, we used to have business interruption. This was only financial indemnification after the fact. Now we are much more playing a role as a consultant with our clients, really planning ahead how we can change the supply chain, how we can build more resilient supply chains. But, I mean, sure, Johannes, you said it. I mean, there is a lot of opportunity. Yes, it is. And we hope that we are on the insurance side, one of the guys that can benefit from these developments, but we should not fool ourselves. I mean, this whole thing, this reconfiguration of the supply chains, this costs a lot, this costs efficiency, prices going up. This is not an endeavor where we can say this is cost-free, this will bring us in a better world. No, we will lose a lot. We will lose a lot of wealth and we will invest a lot. And as also I mentioned, it, that we now in a situation where this is this geopolitical changes, supply changes, that monetary policy is not as powerful as it used to be. It's not longer the only game in town. Fiscal policy comes into the space, and you said there's fiscal space, very euphemistically, I would say, because in the end, what we see, we spend a lot of money. I'm not saying we waste a lot of money on subsidies to build ships factories here in Germany, to build battery factories in Ireland. So this is this renaissance of industrial policy, big time, big time. And it's really a big question if it really leads to an increase in social wealth, or is this not a way to, to waste a lot of money. And my impression is that many policymakers, politicians, still live in this kind of la-la land where they think there's capital for free. But this is the past. This was 10 years, five years ago, where you can spend a lot of money and still there was a lot of capital. The savings cloud is over. We now have to compete for capital on a global level. That's also why it's so important to have a global financial market. Mm. And this means but you have to trade offs. You have to make decisions. You cannot have both. And this is the old coming back. I mean, it's now in Europe, I mean, especially in Germany, you can feel it is still not realized, but we're in a situation where we have to choose between guns and butters. This is the reality, and that means that we also have with the finance, with the sustainable finance, we are so urgently need to, to have these rules, regulation, reporting things. We have to mainstream the sustainability into the finance, because there is sustainable finance or else. This has to be in the all heads. We can no longer afford to invest things in, in, in investment and in projects that are not sustainable. And this is also, Mark mentioned, it's this domestic thing and the uncertainty. I mean, yes, there's uncertainty. We don't know the outcome, but what is very likely that we face in Europe, as well as in the US, a green backlash. And this is the last thing. I mean, you had this Institute for Populism. I think the worst thing we can afford is climate populism. And we are very close also to this situation. And this means we have to find ways where we really put it into the DNA of all the regulations, of all the laws that just cannot be moved against it again. I mean, in Germany, we have this debt break. This is in the Constitution. Maybe we should think about something similar with sustainable finance to make sure that really capital is a scarce source and that is really used for the right uh, projects and no longer wasted for something we cannot longer afford because we are very close to a situation where uh, sustainability or this becomes many things become unsustainable not only for geopolitical reasons, but also for geopolitical reasons. Sorry that I <laughs> gave this a little Thankfully, bit <laughs> Thank you for the answer. Thankfully, we have 10 more minutes to <clears throat> not stop on such a depressing analysis where we not only have to compete for capital, but are in a situation where the <coughs> populism at home will both create a backlash against the green transition and against any sort of globalism is the word, I think, no? So that I think kills capital markets altogether. So let's, uh, 15 minutes left. Oh my God, <coughs> a, a lot of time. That's wonderful because I'd like to get you to respond to some of the things you heard. And uh, I see uh, Johannes already had his hand up that uh, there are topics that have overlapped. So please come in. Thank you. I, I just want to you know, bring, the, bring the ESG or sustainability discussion back to something that I think is, is realistic and achievable uh, and equally important, right? And that is disclosure. Um, because uh, uniform, standardized, um, aligned disclosure requirements highlight a lot. They bring transparency in the game, right? They show you risks and opportunities. The political debate will then be about what's a risk and what's an opportunity. But first of all, it's about aligning reporting requirements. And I think it's an interesting uh, to keep in mind, as a global bank, for example, we are a preparer of ESG reports. 
but we're of course also consumer. What our clients disclose helps us to better understand how they plan, how they adapt to a transition to a low carbon economy. So it goes both ways, right? I think the important thing is that element of harmonization. This is a transatlantic conference and investors need comparable data, right? Because investors are global. So if you have different subsidiaries of international companies disclosing different kinds of information in different jurisdictions, that isn't terribly helpful for investors. And I think there, you know, the European Union has uh, the ESRS and then the US, you know, we've had that recent SEC climate rule and we have the ISSB in Frankfurt now, the Sustainability Standards Board, which a whole set of other jurisdictions looks, looks set to follow. That isn't, that isn't the most helpful development from an investor perspective. But if you look at what's happening, the European Commission and the IIS, ISSB just decided, okay, let's map our requirements against each other and let's see, you know, let's compare and contrast. So there's, there's helpful developments there. And I think just, just one last sentence as a wider point on, on the transition to the low carbon economy. Um, I think it's important governments and regulators understand that move from voluntary to, regula uh, to a regulated reporting is tough. Uh, it requires investment in skills, in data and technology, not just for industry or our clients, also for auditors. Um, and then I think second, even more of an overarching theme is the importance of policy certainty, right? And investors, it's about, de the game is about deployment of capital. And you don't deploy capital unless you have certainty, policy certainty. That may be financial support for de-risking and early stage technology. It may be, yes, it may be tax breaks. U.S. is our home market. This is, you know, a personal remark, but the Inflation Reduction Act is not going so badly. You, could, you, you, pick, you pick your way, you pick your policy as a sovereign government, but policy certainty is, is important, right? If you don't have that, investors won't deploy capital. And if you do invest in being able to follow certain reporting standards, you don't want to change six months later to do the other one. There you go. <laughs> Niels Tam. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to uh, fully subscribe to what Johannes just said. And, and I think there, the risk is that currently, because you have the political uncertainty, you have the divergence in regulation, that investors become more and more geographically looking at what is the system here and what's the system there and, 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 and transatlantic wise I think uh, we need to move closer together again to harmonize it because disclosure is key uh, definitely uh, on the other hand I think also what what uh, the war in the Ukraine has shown is you also need an adaptive system right because uh, under anyway strict ESG rules uh, none of the defense industry would get money um, but they need it, right? So, and if you look at one of the big, the last biggest IPOs at, at Deutsche Börse, they were all from the defense industry, Rheinmetall, Rank, etc. Mm. Right. So, I think that is also something where uh, systems need to be adaptive because capital markets are adaptive to trends, and and they need to be adaptive to trends. And one last point, I think, is we are talking about transition. So um, as an exchange, if we, for example, Deutsche Börse would, would say listing criteria as of the next in, in five years is if you're not fully uh, compliant with ESG, you're being delisted, um, that would be causing quite an upheaval to, uh, to, the, to the capital markets. Plus, we would lose a lot of uh, industries that are in transition, right? Because it's, it's, there are industries which are now growing and, and, and being established, which are sustainable right from the beginning. Um, so, so you have a lot of startups who develop sustainable uh, technologies or technologies to enable sustainability, etc. cetera. Um, but of course, you have also a lot of old industry, which is in transition to a more net zero economy. And those, those who are listed on an exchange need the capital to do that. And, 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 and that is uh, not to be forgotten also in, in, in this debate that we should not, in a way, uh, lose parts of the industry who are able to transform, but who need the capital also to do it. Thank you very much. Rüdiger von Kleist. Uh, yes, thank you. Let's talk about solutions. 
I think uh, what we need, and I completely agree, with, you know, trust in the system, the future of the system, uh, in the future of the system, which means we have two guardrails in, in German politics, German financial politics, which is no new debt because we have a constitutional rule, and no new taxes because I think everybody in the room probably feels the same. We are over, no, probably not overtaxed. I'm from <laughs> Ministry of Finance, so we are perfectly taxed, <laughs> but we shouldn't go any further. It's not helpful if. Again and again and again, people said, oh, well, we could loosen the debt break or we could, you know, impose more. No, no, it's not helpful. I think, I think we are in an excellent fiscal position compared to everybody else. We're the last G7 country with a AAA rating mm -hmm. that saves us billions of euros every year because we have those guardrails. So it's not helpful to scream for new money, and that, of course, goes to climate finance. There will not be new money for climate finance. Full stop. We don't have the money. And that means we will have to find other sources. Those other sources are other donors, part as we like to call them, or they like to call themselves, part one countries, and of course the private sector. And what do we need for the private sector? We need a, a orderly, ordnungspolitisches Rahmenwerk. Unfortunately, there's no good English translation for this. <laughs> you know? But we need reliability, we need rules which don't change every day, and we need to give private companies the room to breathe, to actually make money, and while making money, provide jobs, pay taxes, and make sure the world is a better place because they keep the regulations. So I think that, that's the solution. Make sure that the government provides a sustainable, stable look out to the future and give private private industry the room, and then we will also get, uh, get, get climate finance, you know, because a lot of countries with, who cannot afford uh, the, the climate transition, they could afford a lot more private investment if they wanted to, and that would raise the necessary money from domestic resources to actually pay for the climate change and not rely on donors. But when I talk to my colleagues, for example, I mean, there is a lot of private capital waiting at the sidelines. The problem is often there are no projects. We need a pipeline of projects we can invest in. This is also where the is a little bit of a bottleneck. That we talk a lot and talk a lot, but the approval and the, you know the bureaucracy, not only in Germany, all over the world, is a little bit slow. So this is one one thing that really is now seen as one of the most uh, highest barriers for private capital to deploy it at large scale into this climate fence. But I agree also with Claudia. There's there's, there's some positive developments. Katarina. Um, I, wa I want to agree, and I want to, <laughs> I want to agree that, and for sure, policy certainty is very important. Policy stability is very important for investment. Um, I don't think Ordnungspolitik will get us where we want to be fast enough, and that's that's really my worry. Um, that we are sort of in a stalemate, and I understand there's there's not enough fiscal space uh, in Europe. Um, to, to commit to new money publicly. We're sort of waiting for new sources. Um, we, we know the counter-arguments from, from, from other countries. Um, and my, my big worry is that, uh, the, that the sort of the focus on, on the policy framework and the stability that the policy framework provides will not get us to where we need in terms of financing the green transition. That is my big worry. No, I also fully agree, but my point is not that we do not need public money, but we have to make sure that the public money has the right priorities. And right now in Germany we increase pensions, but curtail, but do not not enough for subsidies for green projects. This is now the choice is taken in Germany, and this is, I think, not sustainable. Hopefully you can agree with that. We're in the heart discussion. I also have Mark Kopelovich who would like to come in. Uh, yeah, I say so. Cornelia mentioned I'm the American in the room, so I, I guess <laughs> I, I, I'm obligated to give a little bit of the American perspective, which is it's important to remember that this discussion about there's no more money and there's trade-offs between guns and butter is entirely political discussion. Right? The, Johannes mentioned how successful the IRA has been. You know, the U.S. is the issuer of the dominant international reserve currency, has effectively unlimited fiscal capacity. And we can talk about the merits of higher debt and whatnot, but in a world where global capital flows have increased by a factor of 40 over the last 50 years and debt has increased by a factor of three, hmm. that there's a lot of fiscal space, right? And the EU as a whole, through the ECB, could choose to issue an enormous amount of debt. The fact that it's not is 
political constraints with, you know, at the European level and here in Germany and in other countries as well. So I think it's, you know, it, it's important to, to think about what the obstacles are and they're primarily that people don't want to do that and there's not political support for governments to do that. Um, not that the country is going to run out of money or that we, we couldn't borrow if we wanted to. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a case that that would be the right thing to do. But if the EU wanted to do that, or if the German government wanted to do that, it would be possible to make that happen. But the fact that, that it's not as about domestic politics. So I like politics, but doesn't it also have to do with the fact that we don't hold the uh, informal reserve currency of the world? Well, the euro holds the number two role, and it's not even close to who's number three. Okay. Right? So, you know, when I think about global finance, you're talking about transatlantic financial power between the US, uh, the dollar and the euro. Um, those are the two games in town, and if we're thinking about policy, certainty matters, and it does. With all of the uncertainty in American and European politics, there's more certainty in American and European politics um, about the safety of our financial investments than there is anywhere else in the world. Just, sorry, yes. if I may, just one point on that. I mean, the, the interest rate burden is just starting to feed its way into the American budget. Mm -hmm. And the way, you know, you have the, the political division within leadership, once your, I don't know how many trillion your debt is at the moment, but you could, could continue issuing debt and interest rates will stay high. Mm -hmm. You will face a problem not of well, issuing it, debt, but of actually paying the interest rate. And uh, because, you know, the Republicans were, okay, let's slash so social spending, and, and the Democrats say, say no way, and sure. you will end up with a stalemate. And that will be become the central problem. But that uh, stalemate is again, is, again, primarily political. I mean, if you look at the, the interest as a share of GDP right now, it's a third of what it was in the 1980s. And even if the worst case scenario projections are true over the next 30 years, we won't even be back to that level of where we were in the 1980s. And in the 80s, the U.S. didn't have trouble borrowing. Right? Interest rates were very high. There was a lot of politics around the borrowing, but the U.S. will be able to borrow. The EU will be able to borrow, um, unless there is a plausible alternative to people wanting to hold dollars and euros. And that gets back to the question about the, the renminbi. If China opened up, if China developed you know, deep, liquid, private financial markets, then there might be a willingness to move out of the dollar and the euro, but that's a, that seems like it's a very long way off. Two, two remarks to that. I wouldn't say that the Remimbi is the alternative, digital currencies, other currencies. I mean, it was very interesting to see how when Facebook started to say we create a digital currency, how all the regulators, all the policymakers around the world really went not went crazy about that and stopped this project because this is really the danger if the people lose the trust in our financial system, in our fiat money. So I wouldn't say, and the other thing, I fully agree, is a policy, policy decision, it's a decision by policymakers. The question is, is this a good or a bad decision? Mm -hmm. And we can see that Japan, for example, has mountains of debt, but no growth at all. This is more or less a, a stagnant country for the last years. It's not monoculture, it has not only to do with the debt burden, but you have this crowding out effect. And if all the capital and all the energy is soaked up by the public sector, then there's nothing left for the private sector. And the cyber private sector gets a little bit uh, stagnant and manic. And this is then for sure, I mean, to, to find, I'm fully with you, I mean, to find the right balance To, to have this kind of, that you really still induce the animal spirits of the private sector and have no crowding out effect and use the right money to, but then I think it's right to take some risk, to have this blended finance, to take some anchor investments. You don't have to go full way. And what we now see that we've spent, as I said, I mean, this is this Intel factor. I mean, probably everybody in the room knows about this in Dresden, 20 billions. This Intel gets 20 billion just to build a fab factory, a fab here in Dresden for nothing. Yep. And it's all technology. I mean, it's not, I'm not an expert, but it's not this, this super, super small thing, but it's more like the, the bulky stuff you can put into cars for sure. I mean, we, we, we love to have something for our cars, but <laughs> I mean, it's not really that you see, you see. Not state of the art technology. This is a way where I think we should find a better balance. But for sure, it's a political decision. And this was a political decision taken by our in the name of resilience, in the name of autarky. We need ship production here in Germany and not only in Taiwan. If, especially if we still will be producing cars in 10 years from now, which is another discussion. <laughs> But I see that we have issues that will remain unresolved. I would like to thank all of you very much for your input in uh, the short 
short amount of time. I'm, I'm quite interested to continue the discussion, but maybe this can happen afterwards also with the audience. And before you leave the room, we want to take a picture of the panel, so whoever is on stage, gather wherever <laughs> Stormy, Stormy tells us to be for the picture, and thank you very much to the audience for listening. I think we'll just rise. <laughs> Thank you.